Good evening and welcome to the program, the Nigerian Governors Live, reaching you from uh, Buja Studio on Silverbird Television. My name is Aon Duna Inga. Now, finally, we have what many would consider a new electoral law in place, and the Independent National Electoral Commission has uh, set the timetable for next year's general elections. Nigerians will file out on the 23rd of February 2023 for the presidential and national assembly elections and 11th March 2023 is the set day uh, for the 2023 elections for governors and state assemblies. Now, before all of these elections, we have the Akiti and Ondo state governorship election coming up, which will be a good opportunity for INEC to test their electoral law. The big question, however, is how well will the political class adhere to this law? I'm referring to the electoral law, of course. Now, we have a former distinguished senator from River State to discuss the topic electoral law as amended and the conduct of elections at state level. You'll meet my guests after this break. Stay with us. <music> Welcome back. The program is the Nigerian Governors Live here on Silverbird Television. Um, my guest on the program today is Senator Magnus Abe. He was a senator in, 2020, uh, in 2011 and 2015, respectively. Uh, he represented the Rivers, uh, State River Southeast Senatorial Zone. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for coming on the program, the Nigerian Governors Live today. Thank you, Andrew. As a matter of fact, you are a friend of the house, so <laughs> it's more like coming back home after a long while. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad to be here. All right, then. So I, I want to go straight. You are, you are a household name when it comes to politics in Nigeria and most importantly in River State. Now, I, I, don't, I want to cut through the chase and just go straight to this question. Are we expecting a Senator Abe running for the 2023 governorship elections in River State? I thought you started by saying we're going to talk about the Electoral Act. Well, and we're going to talk well about <laughs> it. We'll talk about that. But yes. it's, just, it's just a question of interest that has been ringing in my head, and I thought let's get that, out, get that out of the way first. Thank you very much. Let me say very honestly that um, I am consulting. I know that I have the experience. I know that I have the capacity. I know that I have quite a whole bag of ideas, and um, I do believe that at this point in time, if anybody is running for office, given where Nigerians are and what they expect, I think it should be people who can actually come with guarantees to the job. These offices are actually, um, actually jobs that people are applying for. And like every other job that has wide consequences, you should be able to have measurable goals and targets you know for your employers to be able to give them clear guarantees as to what you can achieve and I believe that I actually have very clear and concise plans that can actually guarantee improvement in the lives of people given the experience I have both <laughs> good and bad because I've been involved in in the governance of this country particularly in River State for so many years. But that said, given the dynamics of today's politics, um, elections are no longer what they used to be. You actually have to have the buy-in of the people. People really need to understand what difference you're bringing to the table. And they need to catch into that uh, vision in order to make it fly. So yes, I am consulting. I have been talking with people. And I have received quite a lot of encouragement in that respect. But I really need to be able to um, tie all the loose ends before I can say um, definitely that we're throwing our heart into the Okay, uh, fair enough. Now, in, while answering that question, you mentioned the people. 
and I'd like to quickly tie that to the new electoral law. Um, is this law, looking at it from um, you, I'm sure you must have been uh, close and seen what the process and up onto the signing, all of the upheavals, the back and forth about the electoral law. But looking at it right now, would you say this law is for the people or for politicians? Because be it as it may, there are people who are still skeptical and still feel that perhaps the, the, the Ninth Assembly has not done such an incredible job. But from your experience in the National Assembly and as a politician, would you say the electoral law is actually for the people now? I think um, you, you need to talk about two separate things. One is the Electoral Act itself. The other one, the elections mm. as a procedure or a process. I believe that over the years, the electoral um, system in this country has gotten quite stronger. It keeps improving. The biggest obstacle to free, fair, credible, and transparent elections in this country has not really been the law. It has been the major actors, the politicians themselves, who are the main users of this product. Well, you are also a part I'm of part of it. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not denying my part. But the Nigerian, the Nigerian, I don't want to say the Nigerian politician, because everybody at the end of the day is a part of our country. Mm. And the politicians actually come from amongst Nigerians. It is from the school teachers, the businessmen, the doctors, the lawyers, Nigerian lawyers, Nigerian engineers, Nigerian priests, that the Nigerian politician, quote and unquote, emerges. Mm. So the Nigerian politician is actually just a Nigerian like everybody else. Now, looking outside the Electoral Act, what has been the history or the commitment of Nigerians to process, to accepting rules, mm. to living by the rules, and working to enhance and strengthen the rules. So if you look at our history in that respect, you will not be surprised when you transcend that history into our politics, and then you begin to see the same levels of rascality, the same uh, uh, determination to bend the rules, no matter how straight they may look, mm. the same inability to submit to process that bedevils everything else that we do in this country. So it's sometimes amusing to me when people single out the politician as if it is only the politicians that uh, model up the electoral process. It is not. If a politician is contesting, the youth coppers who come to act as electoral clerks and presiding mm. officers, they are not the politician contesting. The policemen who come whose job, quote and unquote, would ordinarily be to maintain order and see that the rules are observed there, they are not the politician. The voters themselves who will come to a place and if they see that you know their opponent is winning, they disrupt the process, they are not the politicians as we understand them. Mm. But if all these segments of Nigerians do not work together, pursuing the same ideal, you know, that the electoral process needs to be free, fair, and credible, and that everybody who submits to the process should be ready to submit and accept the outcome. The judges, too, are part of the electoral process in this country. And a lot of the pronouncements of the courts on the, the entire process has also been part of the challenges that we face in our elections. Mm. So I don't think it's a question of saying, you know, how good the Nigerian politician is and how committed they are. I think it's a question of saying, what are we doing to try to train Nigerians, to try to invest in our people? Because it is a people that is a country. You know, most times, often yeah. people, are, people are quick to say, uh, talk about the Nigerian populace as far as the electoral process is concerned. And this argument has been on. It's either with uh, when you talk to INEC, INEC will say the, 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 that responsibility falls to the political party and the politicians to educate the people. And in some cases, uh, politicians expect that INEC or sh should carry on that responsibility, but whose responsibility is it? Now we have a new electoral law in place. Perhaps a large number of Nigerians may not have the time to really sit down and study and know what exactly 
it, ent it entails. So whose responsibility is it to educate the average Nigerian who will eventually be the electorate? Well, I think that um, the, the responsibility for creating more patriotic and ultimately a more valuable citizens in any society is that of the society itself. Nobody is exempt from that responsibility of mm. us all coming together to push the ideals of a better Nigeria, which I think we all desire mm. or all claim to desire. But the point I would like to make is that no matter where you stand on these issues, the Electoral Act in its present form is a definite improvement on where we have been before. Okay. It gives INEC the um, power to use technology in ways that they didn't have before. It gives legal backing to the use of technology. Oh. It, it provides for the transmission of results directly you know, without necessarily going through the whole process of uh, having collation centers where results are brought and then a lot of people believe that where results are, that's where results are actually manipulated. Mm. It also um, gives clear guidelines to take, the, to give time to the political parties and INEC itself to clear up the process so that by the time somebody is elected or by the time somebody assumes an office, a lot of the backwater movements that keep these people at, at the tip of their toes and make it impossible for them to function are eliminated. So no matter how you look at it, this act gives more power to the Nigerian people, okay. gives them a greater voice in the choice of what actually happens on election day. It eliminates the possibility Mm. that, you know, people who don't exist can determine the election or people who, who, who control institutions mm. can actually project an outcome that must come to pass. Mm. So no matter how you look at it, with the assent to this act, the process of elections in this country has taken another giant leap forward. Mm. But ultimately, like I said, it is the Nigerian people it is our own commitment to democracy. It is our own actions, both during, before, and after elections, that will clean up the process ultimately, where we ourselves refuse to accept people who try to manipulate the, the, the process, hmm. where we make it unacceptable, where we actually see it as evil beyond words, for people to try to manipulate that process and we distance ourselves from that kind of conduct when we get there a lot of the laws that we have will not even be necessary okay because common decency you know common decency and fairness amongst human beings will make us understand that if we're meeting now for example me and you now contesting an election in this studio okay. we need to get everybody's voice hmm. that's the only way we'll accept that you know the process is fair and the outcome is good hmm. and if both of us understand that there'll be no need for us to try to you know you're trying to outsmart me or trying to do anything that i can't see or try you know all those things will just disappear if we're all on the same page okay. but for now the average politician goes out to an election with nothing but a determination to get to capture the results, no matter what the rules may be. Yeah. So we keep having to fight against that. But I believe that we're in a much better place now okay. than we have been in the past. You know, I love the, that word you use, capture, because that seems to be um, uh, what we ha may have seen over the years. But... Um, Clause 84, subsection 12, no political appointee at any level should be a voting delegate or be voted for at the convention or congress of any political party for the purpose of the nomination of candidate for any election. Apparently, Mr. President wants that part expunged from uh, the, the electoral law. It was just signed in. Uh, do you think, do you, do you toe the line of Mr. President or perhaps um, what do you think was the thinking? You, I, I know you're not in the National Assembly at the moment, but these are some of your colleagues. What do you think was their thinking when they put this in the, na in the Electoral Act? Well, I think that um, what the National Assembly is trying to do 
You, you know, people don't understand that sometimes out of um, politics is actually a game of interest mm. and negotiations, compromise, and all that. You see, members of the National Assembly have themselves come to realize that the process we have in the country does not give anybody a fair chance. Mm. You know, if you look at that provision, what it's designed to do is designed to stop the governors or the president appointing people solely for purpose of going to go and capture the, the primaries. Mm. Because if you say commissioners and uh, all this and all that will be delegates and all that, if a governor looks at his position and his position is weak, he will simply appoint so many position, uh, commissioners, special advisors and all that to overwhelm the elected delegates mm. and produce the result that he has already predetermined. Okay. So what the legislature, the way I understand it, because a lot of them have been victims of that process okay. where the governors have near absolute power. To so it's personal, it. not necessarily... Most laws, people. most laws at the end of the day uh, reflect personal interest. If you want a cleaner environment and the legislature passes a law to create a cleaner environment, for you that's personal because that's what you want. Mm. For the person who may be a businessman whose business requires more pollution to be able to be, be profitable, he may think that that law is against him. So when you say laws are personal or not personal, it's irrelevant. At the end of the day, laws outlive whoever may have passed it. Even when Lincoln, for example, was passing the Emancipation Proclamation, mm. he had to bribe some legislators. He did all sorts of things, promised some people appointment, but the end result was that the slaves were free. Mm -hmm. So when you're making law, the mere fact that uh, the person who is voting the law or supporting it believes that he has something that he's going to get out of it does not make the law bad because at the end of the day the real beneficiaries of this effort will be the nigerian people because what the legislators are trying to do is to clear a way for the nigerian people to choose them if they want to mm. and if their governors don't want them mm. so that's what it is so you can't say that is bad just because it is good for the legislators who are currently there but it gives you an opportunity tomorrow if you want to take advantage but of it. Some people have suggested that um, it is not necessarily Mr. President who has made that suggestion. Perhaps the AGF, some heard, suggested that probably the AGF speaking to Mr. through Mr. President to have that law expunged. You, what's your take on that? Well, the AGF is the legal advisor to the President. And then... Um, he must have his own views and reasons why he holds his views however he holds them you see the same way you're saying that the legislators are supporting that position because it is personal to them is the same way you are now accusing the agf of doing the same thing but the truth of the matter is that these are the people who are vested with the constitutional role to make input into these processes. And they have to make that input no matter what informs their input. Hmm. You, you understand what hmm. I mean? But at the end of the day, what is important is that they are convinced that this is what is best for Nigeria and they are free to push their positions, okay. including the AGF. But where we stand as of today is that the law has been assented to. And that section that you read is today the law of Nigeria. If it is going to be amended and it is going to be taken out, there is a process by which that will be done. But as of today, as we speak, that is the law of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And every Nigerian is supposed to obey the law. Hmm. That's where we are today. So Mr. President had asked that that section be reconsidered because he feels that it impugns on the constitutional right hmm. of he, the appointees and all that to take part in the process which has been given to them by the constitution mm -hmm. that's his position and he's part of the process he can send that position back to the national assembly as a proposed executive amendment okay. or he can depend on the national assembly to generate it as an understanding between them but however it is there must still be a process by which that section can be reversed. As of today, that is a law. All right. Uh, uh, so let's 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 bring it down to 
our states to the state's level. You know, we see the level of influence uh, governors wield, particularly when it comes to elections in their domain. It's almost impossible for one to sit and predict that um, an incumbent governor is going to lose an election or perhaps his anointed candidate will lose an election. Now, having this law right now, do you think it's going to change the dynamic of uh, elections even at state level? Yes, I believe so. Um, this law does not apply to state elections. It's mm. for the federal elections that are conducted by the Independent National mm. Electoral Commission. The states, over the years, the kind of democracy that they are asking for mm. from the federal government, the governors don't allow it in their own states. I was uh, talking to people. I always give the example of uh, the Australian High Commissioner who met with a governor in this country. And the governor was proudly telling the uh, Australian High Commissioner um, how every councillor in his state belongs to his party, every member of house belongs to his party, every elected person uh, in this state is a member of a party trying to showcase the strength of the party. And the High Commissioner said to him that that actually shows the weakness of your democracy. So where democracy is strong, the majority will, of course, have a majority. But those who do not agree with the majority will also have a voice. And the strength of a democracy is not in the presence of the majority, but it is reflected in the strength of the minority. Mm. Because like you and I know, every chain is only as strong as its weakest link mm -hmm. and the weak link in a democracy is a minority mm. so if the minority has no voice it does not exist cannot win any seat has no um, even participation in the democratic space then that democracy is weak or dead as the case may be and you find that in a lot of the states when the states conduct elections, nobody apart from the governor's party wins anything. That has been more or less the norm. But when the federal uh, authorities, INEC, conducts an election, oppositions can win. Mm. The majority can win. The majority at the end of the day may get more, but the opposition also are able to have their own areas of strength and they can also win. That's what keeps our democracy alive. So in as much as um, the governors have been celebrating the electoral, the, the signing of the Electoral mm -hmm. Act, because mm -hmm. every Nigerian benefits from it, mm. I think that it is now important for us as Nigerians to actually imbibe not just the letter of our laws that promote democracy, but the spirit of our understanding of a nation, as a nation, that we should uphold and promote democracy. And that call extends to the governors in the conduct of local government elections. All right. If democracy is not strong at the grassroots, if there is no opposition at the grassroots, if the councils are more or less total appointees of the chief executive, then it is difficult for us to see how real democracy will take root in this country. Did, this, did you just have um, this epiphany or because you have been part of this process too even at state level. Um, we see politicians perhaps who are not uh, within the circle of power uh, say some of these things like you've mentioned. I mean this has been a problem. Um, if you were in power, we, you, at points where you were in power, why didn't you say to see these things differently? That was it. I don't want to, you don't, you don't come out and buck the system, mm. but I have always tried as much as possible to support the idea that we should actually have free, fair, and credible elections. I know that if you're part of the government, the idea that a government has so many things that they can use to gather more people mm. than you that you're not the government. Mm. So the fact that you allow democracy does not necessarily mean that you will lose power. Mm. You, you will still get over 50 or 60 percent of the votes and the majority and the seats and all that. You understand what I mean? Yes. But the opposition will also get something. Mm. But the, the fear of a lot of Nigerian politicians is that you don't allow room 
for anybody to even rear their head. So that leads to the friction you have when freedom is not allowed. There are laws in this country that you can use to keep people within their bounds. You, you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it is government that has access to that power. So you can always deploy it if the opposition gets a criminal or whatever. You, you understand what I mean? You don't have to sit here and say, oh, it's the opposition that is doing this thing, you mm -hmm. know, and all that. If you have evidence that they're doing it and the thing is against the law, you prosecute them. That's what I understand. And that's what happens in a democracy. All right. So it's not that the government has no power, but you allow them space. Mm. Allowing them space does not mean that you won't win. All right. If you don't win, it's because you are incompetent and lousy. Because if you have the government, you have the entire budget, you're the one who can give the people what they want, and you're listening to them, you should be able to win. Okay. I think that would be a good place to end the conversation. I wish you could go on and on. Several uh, things to talk about, but I hope that in the not-too-distant future, we'll get to talk a bit more uh, on future elections, uh, even as we go into uh, the electionary uh, uh, season proper. Uh, my guests, on, thank you so much, Senator, for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Yes. It's my pleasure to be All here. All right, then. So my guest has been Senator Magnus Ibe. He was uh, Abe. I beg your pardon. Uh, he was a senator in 2011 and in 2015. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being a part of the program as well. We discussed uh, extensively on the topic, uh, looking at the electoral law and, of course, how it affects uh, our states, uh, talking about uh, state governors and what have you. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. We'll be back with another edition of the program, same time, same station, next week. My name is Aon Duna Inga. Do have a pleasant evening. <laughs>